You're listening to The Adventuring Party, talking about gaming the Irish way. Welcome to the party. I'm Savage Mick. And I'm Warlord Scar. Now, Warlord, I've got the fire lit. It's crackling away. I've got the the big wingback leather armchairs. I've pulled them in close. uh, And there's just a little something there on the table for you if you need to wet your whistle. Um, uh, That's a mighty tome you've brought with you. What, uh, What is it? Why, I have found the greatest of all tomes, the foundational text of all of RPG Topia. Uh, the text from Fatal. Which... No. Um, no. I am actually referring to uh, the first the first edition, Advanced Dungeons & Dragons Dungeon Master's Guide, the magnum opus of Gary Gygax himself. Legasp. Yeah. Um, this is going back away. Yeah, this is from 1979. I don't think even was... five years since the release of original D&D. Um, for those Ooh. who don't, don't know, Advanced AD&D first Ed came out in a weirdly staggered way. Uh, the Monster Manual came out in 1977 um, in such a way that it had to be compatible with original D&D. Um, uh. Around about this time, I think ba- the first basic set came out. So, you know, that was another big explosion of players. Uh, then the PHB came out in 1978. And this this text came out in 1979. So, people were... You have to imagine that 1979, all these DMs who had been flabbergasted by the appearance of paladins? Magic items? Uh, all the stuff in the original PHB... I had were were chomping at the bit for, for this tome to come out, and it came with a sickening two hundred and thirty odd pages of raw, uncut Gygax. Um, I think my <laughs> favorite. St- I've actually listened to another podcast called Plot Points, uh, who have who attempted to read through this book, and uh, I'm not sure they actually got that far i think they got about page 30 and then real life just just killed the attempt um but they actually had a very interesting anecdote about the creation of uh the uh, the editing of this tome where oh. Oh, okay you you had my attention now you have my interest and just to pull the veil back a little just a moment folks the the warlord has acquired an actual copy yeah. Dust, hair, fingernails, all the usual things you'd expect to fall out of an old book are there. You, it's in remarkably good condition, you reckon? Yeah, pretty good. Um, mine, the weird, the weirdest thing about this one, apart from random uh, pencil and pen marks on random sections for whatever reason, is that there's <laughs> someone's little suitcase key taped the inside front cover for reasons I have no way of, of fathoming. It's a mystery if... lost the ages. If uh, if you're looking for a suitcase key, please contact us on our Discord. Uh, <laughs> now, I uh, I was kind of chewing over whether to to go and pick up the PDF uh, for the princely sum of of ten dollars. What did you spend for yours? Uh, well, I I spent uh, about two hundred uh, euro, but this was in the Galecon charity auction. Come to Galecon online uh, at the <laughs> Halloween bank holiday weekend uh, on a fine Discord near you. Um, yeah, I went. To, I attended the charity auction. Spent um, spent two hundred euro or so, possibly more. I can't remember. On <laughs> a box with a whole bunch of classic forty k books, plus copies of the Dungeon Master's Guide and the Monster Manual. And I think I wow, I I, I feel like it's an investment for the future. Uh, and also, just just a, a glory to read. It has been a wild ride. I I'm about. We're about to find out. Yeah, yeah, that's it. But yes, I had an anecdote to tell. Um, Go, sorry, go on, yes. So the tale goes that there was this young, enterprising adventure writer called Lawrence Schick who had had basically a bunch of ideas for uh, a cool dungeon and he sort of packaged them together, the the absolute cream of his nonsense. Um... Uh, and they put it together in the form of White Plume Mountain, 
very infamous old adventurer with such uh, guys with, with with such um wonderful features as the river that is floating in midair um the the fight with a giant crab inside a volcano pool where if you hit the sides of the wall you all drown and get boiled like lobsters and um the weird gladiator-esque just... <laughs> anarchist challenge um uh mud jump from platform to platform over the mud uh pit thing where you know you jump across and try not to fall in the pit and die and then you fight the vampire at the end right the mud vampire okay yeah no classic. no it's just a regular vampire it just lives next to the mud room <laughs> so <laughs> mr shick i assume put this together and sent it off to tsr uh, assuming that they would have you know an editing process uh, that might point out to them the absolute ridiculousness of this uh, scenario and the nonsense he put about about gnomes and uh, ancient wizards uh, that he had uh, slapped on the front cover. Um, I don't think he got an editor's note back. I think he got his first royalty check back. As he said, <laughs> yeah, this is great. We're printing it. And he's like, what? Send more of that. They just printed it as it was. Apparently so. That is how the story goes. Yikes. Uh, and he says, you have a job at TSR now. Please come to Lake Geneva. And it's just like... <laughs> Report your station. Yes. Wait, what? Apparently, what? <laughs> he walks in on the Monday morning. He wa- and, and he meets a beardy old fellow by the name of Gary Gygax, his idol and uh, icon. Uh, whereupon Gy- Gygax apparently asks him, are you the new guy? And he's just like, yeah. Hands him a box of notes uh, saying, this is the Dungeon Master's Guide. This is five years of all of my experience uh, creating and running this game in one place. You're the editor now. Right. That's the story. I I don't know if it's true, but it's a hell of a story. I'm looking at the... So I've just flipped the cover. And uh, I'm looking at the, the credits. I don't see him here. He's not well. They don't list an editor. I suppose those weren't things that you listed. Yeah, the all the 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 credits only list the artists involved, uh, which is quite a few. Uh, from um, one Darlene Pickle, who yeah. I believe was, was their map lady, uh, David C. Sutherland the third, who is the main illustrator, the ever ever infamous Errol Otis, uh, with his uh, slightly zanier style. <laughs> yeah, these are classic names. Um, but yeah. Well, uh, you want to talk Zany. These sit below uh, a picture which I'm sure has graced many a, a tattoo of what looks like a pre shitting unicorn. Uh, this thing looks like it's about to take a dump. It's quite nicely rendered, sort of slightly pointless style. But uh, yeah, there's black and white unicorn that looks like it's about to drop apples uh, all over. Uh, the text below. Yeah. So we're off to a great start. Well, and of course you, you, you that, that fairground cover. You skipped past the front cover. Oh uh, well, see, I can't do the cover justice. You're going to have to describe the yeah, cover to so, us. Yeah. Uh, so Savage has using a is using a PDF copy, so he's only seeing uh, a small portion of, the, of this uh, wonderful. All okay. So according to text, the inside of this, this is apparently set on the plain of infinite fire, a uh, wonderful place. You know. Uh, great, great uh, black market and such. Uh, but this is like all black cover, uh, with this gigantic red demon-looking thing, which the text assures us is an Efriti, but is about four times taller than even an Efriti should be. Uh, definitely looks like it's some form of Japanese ogre. Um, wearing. Two belts and a medallion. That's about it. Um, uh, grasping a lady wearing about the same amount. Uh, facing <laughs> off against a overdressed knight and possibly wizard or cleric uh, who are just sort of who are doing the um, uh, the bad comic book artist trick of hiding the guy's feet. 
Yeah. So it's classic. Uh, also, yeah. it looks like they're they're halfway through performing the YMCA. <laughs> uh, and yeah. it is one it is one guy who brought all his adventure gear, and another guy who just got out of the shower and put a robe on. <laughs> um. Yeah. It's great cover. A I'll... foreword by Mike Carr, but it's mostly just saying how DMing is cool. Do you want to skip that and get straight to the uncut guy gax? We'll we'll get there. Yeah, we're going to go straight there. But I, I would like to point out. Uh, so sixteenth of May, nineteen seventy nine. So this is older than nine, by a couple of months. And mm. that first line is dungeon mastering an art or a science. An interesting question. Well, I don't think we've I don't think we've answered that one yet. Let's see what Mister Gygax has to say. So you take the reins now, Warlord, and uh, we're going to go at pace, listeners. We don't know. Now, sitting here at the third quarter of, what is it, 2021, we don't know how long this could go on for. We don't know what's going to happen next. We may all return to our offices. But we're just going to, you know, let the fire crackle away. Let the, the drinks mellow. And just, and we're not going to, we're not line by line, are we? We might go paragraph by paragraph. Maybe skip the odd page. But I let me assure you of something. However long this goes on. I'm going to be talking about the artwork, because it is wild. <laughs> All right, take us away. Okay. So. What page are we on? What follows herein is strictly for the eyes of you, the campaign referee. So, first line. Just... We're already uh, we're already diving back into Gygax's original wargaming terminology to explain who you are. Uh, Excellent. So, we've got um, to page seven. This is the preface. This, this is the man himself, right? Yeah, this is this cool. is Guy Gax's own preface. Um, as the creator and ultimate authority in your respective game, this work is written is written as one dungeon master equal to another. Pronouncements there may be, but they are not from on high as respects your game. The dictums are given for the sake of the game only. For if advanced Dungeons and Dragons is to survive and grow. It must have some degree of uniformity, a familiarity of method and procedure from campaign to campaign within the whole. Advanced D&D is more than a framework around which individual DNs construct their respective milieu. That's a, that's a word for the drinking game. He loves, he can't, he, the, the word, the term campaign setting just does not, a, just does not work for Gygax. It has to be a milieu. <laughs> It is above all a set of boundaries for all the worlds, quotation marks, devised by referees everywhere. These boundaries are broad and spacious, and there are numerous areas where they are so vague and amorphous as to make them nearly non-existent, but they are there nonetheless. So that's the first paragraph. Okay, just a, a note to any of the legal eagles out there. We have not actually secured the theatrical rights to the DMG. <laughs> but uh, for the purposes of review and criticism, we will, we will be continuing in this line. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's the stall set out. Uh, it's First it's a though. weird. It's just a weird counterbalance between, you know, we need to set all the stuff in stone, but also we're both just DMs. We're both just giving each other advice. It's all cool. It's 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 this weird juxtaposition of of the ex- one extreme and the other. Uh, and I, I feel like that's going to keep coming up, particularly in this preface mm. part, because, like, there's an awful lot of, you know, internet ink spilt over Gygax's motivations for creating this very stricted rulesy version of the game, as opposed to the more lighter, freeform, original D&D. And whether he was literally just trying to force all DMs to adhere to a style more like his own but like he also is at the end of the day a what the mo- by definition one of the two most experienced dms in the world so you know he has a lot of good practical advice that to uh, pass on to people so that that's just a vibe i've noticed as i've been reading and uh yeah i think it, we might see a bit more of it going on particularly in this preface yeah, we're only in the preface, guys, uh, and it's uh, two pages of preface, nearly two pages of preface. It's still single column. We haven't actually gotten to the the meat of this yet. This is yeah. just laying out the stall. Um, okay. 
paragraph two, I guess. When you, when you build your campaign, you will tailor it to suit your personal tastes. In the heat of play, it will slowly evolve into a compound of your personality and those of your better participants, a superior ally. And as long as your campaign remains viable, it will continue a so, slow process of change and growth. In this lies a great danger, however. The systems and parameters contained in the whole of Advanced Dungeons and Dragons are based <laughs> on a great deal of knowledge, experience gained through discussion, play, testing, questioning, and hopefully personal insight. Okay, so yes, I, every time he he capitalizes and bolds the trademark name of his product, I think I'm, I'm obligated to read it out loud because he does that a lot. Um, there's an awful lot of uh, trademark setting uh, in the, in this text. I have to say, yeah. Well, they were getting serious at that point, weren't they? they yeah, they this was something. This was the. This is a serious thing for serious uh, big companies now. TSR was actually moving a lot of product at this point, and this was the hotly anticipated DMG to go with the PHP. Uh, so, yeah, this was the point where D D was really starting to take off and. Yeah, um, they were trying to pitch. Gygax in particular was trying to pitch a stall with this with this book, but there is the. I just want to point out the line of, uh, your campaign will evolve into a compound of your personality and those of your better pers- participants. I feel I could pick at that a bit, but like, there's there's stuff. <laughs> well, it's probably a podcast episode in this. Gygax certainly did believe that there were people who were good players and there were people who played because it was Tuesday and it was game night and there were people who played because they heard of this D&D thing. I feel like Gygax assumed a position that you were going to run your campaign and there was going to be, going to be a lot of one-time yobos coming through and you just had to grin your teeth, let them play for session or three, wait for them to get bored and leave, and then go back to your real players. Um, yeah, I mean, if, if you want to be a little more generous about it, he's pointing out, or you know, he's making sure you understand real early on that frustrated authors should not apply. This mm-hmm. is going to be a collaboration. And there's going to be buy-in at different levels from different players, but the ones who you really kind of gel with are going to bring an awful lot into the game that you're going to meld and, and form around. You know, that's superior alloy. Uh, yeah, I can get behind that. Yeah, I mean, that's also a take on it. Um, okay, one more. Excuse me. <laughs> Limitations, checks, and balances, and all the rest are paced into the system in order to assure that what is based thereon will be a superior campaign. A campaign which offers the most interesting play possibilities to the greatest number of participants for the longest period of time possible. You, as referee, will have to devote countless hours of real effort in order to produce just a fledgling campaign. Uh, A background such as a background for the whole, some small village or town, and a reasoned series of dungeon levels, the lot of which must be suitable for elaboration and expansion on a periodic basis. To obtain real satisfaction from such effort, you must have participants who will make use of your creations. Players to learn the wonders and face the perils you have devised for them. If it is all too plain and too easy, the players will quickly lose interest and your efforts will prove to have been in vain. Likewise, if the campaign is too difficult, players will quickly become discouraged and lose interest in a game where they are always the butt. Again, your labours will have been for naught. These facts are of prime importance for the underlying many rules. That's mm. an, inter- an interesting one. Well, first off, you know, we're starting off with um, poor, what was poor uh, GM syndrome um, uh, getting that started early because, yeah, I mean, yeah, you do have to prep <laughs> a lot. But it is, I, it is interesting I, to see I, that no one is immune to this. I love that line, though, uh, and a reasoned series of dungeon levels. Gary Gygax quote. Also Gary Gygax quote. Here, new guy. Yeah, the guy who made the mud vampire encounter. <laughs> Edit this book. Yeah, sure. He's clearly got so much prep time to do for his campaign. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. 
Uh, it's a, it's an interesting one. <laughs> um, but yeah, the 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 point at the end is 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 interesting because it's sort of laying out that you know you can't go too easy on on, on people, um, and you can't go too hard on them, or they just stop and there's no game, which is fine advice. Um, so yeah. It's interesting though that the the suggest that all of these rules and there's going to be an awful lot of rules uh, through this and I don't have a don't have a copy of the PHB per se but uh, I've heard some interesting things about something called weapon speed which uh, became infamous as time went on. Hmm. Um, as just like that that they're setting up this sort of precedent of the rules are there for a reason, guys, because you know set the difficulty right otherwise. It'll be weird, you know. I check and get the uh, the logic for, but hmm. well, we'll put a pin in it, I suppose. <laughs> Let's go. Na- okay. So what was next? Oh yeah. Naturally, everything possible cannot be included in the whole of this work. As a participant in the game, I would not care to have anyone telling me exactly what must go into campaign and how it must be handled. If so, why not play some game like chess? As the author, I also realise there are limits to my creativity and imagination. Others will think of things I didn't and devise things beyond my capability. As an active dungeon master, I kept a careful watch for things which would uh, tend to complicate matters without improving them. Systems devised seemingly to make the game drag for players. Rules which lessened the fantastic and unexpected in favour of the mundane and ordinary. As if it there, as if that were not enough hats to wear, I also wore that of a publisher, watching the work so as to make sure it did not grow so large as to become unmanageable cost-wise. None of this was compromised per se, but the process was most certainly a refining of what should logically be presented in the system. Well, that's okay, a, that's I'm just warming sort of, to this. You say See, that now, and th- uh, uh, like, in isolation, this paragraph is great sentiment to have. But you'll have to remember that when we get to the disease rules, the hireling rules, the henchman rules, which are a completely different thing from hirelings. These are all... I mean, are, what do you want? Do you want another 40 pages of spells instead? Oh. This, is for, this is the magic right here, folks. How The hiring and firing of hirelings and henchmen, diseased or otherwise. Um, okay, look, I appreciate... you got to remember when this was made... Like if you were a publisher or even anyone even remotely linked to publishing, you were aware that it cost, like you could cost things to the page. And it, well, it was a bit more expensive back then. The entire process of publishing was more expensive back then. Mm -hmm. Um, And especially for something, you know, as niche as D&D, you really had to, to have a good handle on your production costs if you wanted to turn a profit, which... This this runs to what two hundred and fifty odd pages, thirty eight uh, I want to say. Yeah, and it's uh, this this is laying down a yeah. lot of the bones of what would come afterwards. And here's one of the restrictions. This is our uh, the reason a shuttle is uh, the size it is because the the width of a, a horse's ass. This is that that's this for RPGs. <laughs> Why are books this length? Well, Gygax had to get a page count in. Yeah. Right, let's go. More okay. of this. Returning again to the framework aspect of Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. What is aimed at is a quote unquote universe into which similar campaigns and parallel worlds can be placed. With certain uniformity of systems and quote unquote laws, the players will be able to move from one campaign to another and know at least the elemental principles which govern the new milieu. For all milieu will have certain, but not all necessarily the same, laws in common. Character races and classes will be nearly the same. Character ability scores will have identical meaning, or nearly so. Magic spells will function in a certain manner regardless of which world the player is functioning in. Magic devices will certainly vary, but their principles will be similar. This uniformity will help not only players, it will enable DMs to carry on a meaningful dialogue an exchange of useful information. It might also lead to grand tournaments wherein players from any part of the US or the world for that matter can compete for accolades. So that started interesting and went somewhere completely different. 
Is, is he going to keep using Milu? Yes. No, he is oh definitely boy. going to use word, keep using Milu. <laughs> I don't think the word campaign setting even comes up in, in this book. Wow. It is always Milieu. Oh, boy. As, as I said, <laughs> that's that's the, that's the drinking game, guys. If you guys want a drinking game, Milieu. That's the, oh, that's the word I've of the started. day. I've oh. started. I'm already drinking. Um, that Yeah, it, he got one thing absolutely bang on right, though. Uh, if you know the basic principles of D&D, you can go from edition to edition, as it turned out, and be on fairly firm ground. Mm-hmm. That's so, certainly uh, true. I find it more interesting that, like, he assumes that players would just, like, take their characters and go to different uh, ca- people's campaigns, as if that was the most normal thing in the world. And to be fair, for Gygax's personal group of nerd friends, it sort of was. Like... Yeah. Like there was a guy, like infamously Rob Kuntz, the the sm- the weird kid who lived in, who slept on Gar Gagas's couch, as I like to call him. Uh, basically ran his own clone of Black Castle Greyhawk, and uh, yeah, they Rob would have his characters playing in Gary's game, and Gary would have a, a, his character Morton Keenan, um, adventuring in uh Rob's game, and. So presumably there was a quite a bit of this sort of back and forth thing. See, that uh, was like Michael Moorcock was knocking out his eternal champion stuff at that point. And oh yeah, the I'm pretty sure there's a, up all over the place. Like I'm pretty sure he's listed in the appendix, one of the appendixes at the back of the book. Appendix N is rather infamous. He's in uh, fact the only member, uh, the only person listed in Appendix N who is still alive. Okay, the deadly Appendix N. Um, well, to be fair, free, again, free 1979, man. Yeah, free love had, had done its thing, so <laughs> like, it was it was just a different time, man. You could take your characters into each other's campaigns, no one worried, no one judged. Yeah, but the, I, I just find it interesting that, that that you know there's going to be things that are universally the same um, since you know the nearly 50 years of the hobby, but also things that are very different. And I I, I like the idea that characters come and go. But campaigns are eternal. That's I think is one of the the things that really strikes me uh, about this book is that you know it, the idea is the campaign world is going to just keep going forever, and characters are going to go up, level up, then retire, and new characters are going to come in on a continuous cycle. But uh, that's not really how uh, games seem to be done these days. We're very much. Campaigns are shorter; they tend to be fairly finite, and characters are in- inherently tied to those uh, shorter campaigns. So it's interesting to see, you know, this formative text being written with that in mind, uh, as opposed to, yeah. um, true to you know, true that. Anyway, uh, let's keep um, going. This, this I mean, we're so <laughs> half an hour again, and we're in the preface. <laughs> one page, one page, and a shitting unicorn in. <laughs> All right. The, uh, but, oh well, actually, one more thing is just like the idea. Gygax really loved the idea of tournaments, and he spent an enormous amount of time trying to force this I, concept of D and D as a tournament game for like ages. Now, to be fair, this was a guy who set up Gen Con, like the biggest gaming convention in the world. So, like. You can understand his biases towards something big and let's say like tournament, but like it's just an aspect that seemed to de- evaporate as soon as he left the company in nineteen eighty two, I think. So, uh, well, it was the early eighties. Look, look, Einstein didn't believe in real energy, so you know you can't get everything right. Mm. Okay, let's move anyway, on. Let's keep going. Um, the danger of a mutable system is that you or your players will have to will go too far in some undesirable direction and end up with a short-lived campaign. Participants will always be pushing for a game that allows them to become strong and powerful far too quickly. Each will attempt to take the game out of your hands and mould it to his or her own ends. To satisfy this natural desire is to issue a death warrant to a campaign. For it will be either a one-player affair, or the players will desert en masse for something more challenging and equitable. Similarly, you must avoid the tendency to drift into areas foreign to the game as a whole. 
such campaigns become so strange as to be no longer a D and D. They are isolated and will usually wither. Variation and difference are desirable, but both must be kept within the boundaries of the overall system. Imaginative and creative addition can certainly be included. That is why Nebrio areas have been built into the game. Keep such individuality in perspective by developing a unique and detailed world based on the rules of Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. No two campaigns will ever be the same, but all will have the common ground necessary to maintaining the whole as a viable entity about which you and your players can communicate with the many thousands of others who who also find sword and sorcery role-playing gaming as an amusing and enjoyable pastime. So, so that's get a- wrecked, Stargate D and D. Oh, that was so satisfying. And look, it's there. It's the, the last line, like sword and sorcery role playing. So the D and I've argued this for a while. The D and D system is suited to it, and really shouldn't go beyond it. Keep your firearms out of it. Keep your sticky politics out of it. Just it's good old fashioned kick in dungeon door stuff. I mean, a little more complicated. I'm sorry, would you like me to get my copy of Ex- Expedition to the Barrier's Peak written by Gary Gygax <laughs> and check what date that came out on? Um, so, uh, that's, that takes the end of the first page. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, right. so it, yeah. it is interesting I... to see, you know, um, the sort Laser, of like, balance like no, la- no laser guns in D&D, right? The man himself said it. Don't, don't get too far off the path. Definitely no laser guns, no craft spaceships, anything like that. Uh, he was he was so certain. <laughs> oh no, what's going on here? Is is Gary guy was Gary guy blah, 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 blah. was Gary Gygax quickly kidnapped and replaced by a doppelganger? I mean, there are yeah. stories of what he got up to in between writing this book and him finally being kicked out of the company. Uh, I won't repeat them here, but I'm sure they make for a very interesting reading if you find the right blog. Um, uh, Anything I don't to say think, on all like, that. If I was to psychoanalyze, and you know, maybe that's a bit unfair, but for my, under- my, 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 under- my understanding is that basically the pressure of being a content producer, as it were, did not suit him terribly well, and he sort of got into the habit of just go with whatever make the book make the book make the book we need to make we need to print more and he would just take from random drag dungeon articles like a few years later he made like unearthed arcana the original which was an awful lot of just terrible uh dungeon ma- dragon magazine articles thrown in together this is where we get the comeliness score which i'm pretty sure at some point he does actually say is a terrible idea in this book but a couple of years later well you need to sell sell some more on after kind so let's fill out that page count oh my god this is right. like n- never let your your heroes um be the uh, the sole guiding light of an uh, endless sea of content i was kind of hoping he just did a lot of drugs but okay well i think he did that too but anyway 70s baby yeah wow right okay but that like that paragraph's just again another wild paragraph we could be here a while uh hands off my game players (laughs) don't get any ideas i'm in charge i mean but other classic piece of wisdom don't focus on your favorite player and make the game about them you've got to spread it around you know Mm -hmm. that's and we've all i think we've all seen people learn that the hard way Mm -hmm. he knew yeah yeah, no, they're oh. like, you're going to get this. I see this a lot. There's an awful lot of, this is a great idea. And then two lines later, this is a terrible idea. Or <laughs> this is a good idea being taken too far. You're going to see an awful lot of that. Because, again, there's there's this is very much. I think one of the th- reasons this is such a beloved book by older gamers is because you can. The Gygax is oozing out of the pages. Like, there's no doubt in anyone's mind Who's writing every goddamn line of this? Particularly since he's there's a, it's about twice as long as it needs to be, thanks to all the extra flowery language. Uh, he use basically he uses all the 
space that he saves by saying milieu instead of campaign setting. And he just uses that on a, an arrangement of $10 words uh, all throughout. Um, look, he had a lot of ideas. Didn't yes, have time he did. To check them all. Didn't have time to check them all. Yes, neither did Lawrence Schick, apparently. <laughs> uh, anyway, let's finish this off. As this book is the exclusive, oh this 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 paragraph, oh boy, this is where you may he may lose a lot of people who are nodding along up to now. As this book is the exclusive precinct of the DM, you must view any non-DM player possessing it as something less than worthy of honourable death. Peeping players, there will undoubtedly be. But they are simply lessening their own enjoyment of the game by taking away some of the sense of wonder that otherwise arises from a game which has rules hidden from participants. It is in your interests and in theirs to discourage possession of this book by players. If any of your participants do read her in, it is, a, it is suggested that you assess them a heavy fee for consulting sages and other sorts of information not normally attainable by the inhabitants of your milieu. If they express knowledge which could only be garnered from consulting these pages, a magic item or two can be taken as a payment. Insufficient, but perhaps it will discourage such actions. Oh boy! Oh, <laughs> okay. Uh, so, uh... it's a very <laughs> weird thing to be telling the people who've bought this book not to let anyone else buy this book. And I, hmm, the business hat is not on for this paragraph. Okay, I don't this know the what hat is speaking. on. <laughs> um, the man who'd rule the world apparently. <laughs> wow. did, did you ever get your official uh, GM card? Was it sent out to you? Because I'm still waiting for mine, uh, and I, I live in fear that I'll be asked to produce it and prove that I shall be in possession of such a book. Uh, <laughs> Ooh, it's a tall order. I mean, like a lot of legislation, they write it, but who's going to police it? Yeah, that's uh, that's fair. Um, but yeah, that's... It's, uh, it's bloody bonkers. Yeah, I don't, I'm don't. really not sure, like, how... I, I feel like, like, if Gygax is being serious in this, and this, this it'd, be inter- it'd be a weird thing to have this entire paragraph just be some kind of weird joke. Um, it, he really does seem to be of the opinion that only the... That there's... People who are eternal DMs and there are people who play and there's yeah. very little overlap. Which, wow, if, if it's that amount of cynicism is settling in already just five years into the hobby. Ugh. It's, it's all written in a very arch way, which kind of lends some credence to the idea it's a bit of a joke. But, I don't know. Yeah. Full screen GM, you know? Gygax came up with that and as far as I know, no one's really run with it. Right. Um, okay, fin- finish us off here. I Okay, I sincerely hope that you will find this new system to your taste and enjoy it. The material is herein, but only you can construct the masterpiece from it. Your personal campaign which will bring hundreds of hours of fun and excitement to many eager players. Masterful dungeoning to you. That's a interesting way of, right. uh, of it's just upbeat ending this. There's, of course, follows a whole bunch of credits, which, to be very... Has it gives a whole bunch of people uh, things. P- many people, of course, who <clears throat> will be well known to um, uh, old school people. Um, oh, yeah. Brian Bloom, um, his son Ernie and Gook, um, Len Lakoff, the Tim Cast, the whole whole bunch of names. Um, the Arnesons. Uh, the guy. Sk- from- uh, Skip, uh, Skip Williams is in there. Who yeah, went oh, yeah, Skip. Found Skip EA. He's been around for a while. No, no, he's just. I think he was just like. The D and D rules guy before they had uh, Kevin Crawford, not Kevin Crawford, the Crawford that they have now, as their say rules person on Twitter. I've forgotten. Uh, but yes, there's a whole bunch of uh, credits and acknowledgements, um, uh, and uh, his lovely signature of E. Gary Gygax, um, and yeah, that's the preface. We've gone. Who am I thinking of? Skip Williams didn't found EA. I've lost my mind. Okay, so yeah, that's uh, that's a bunch. We've um, gone two pages in, guys. 
Uh, I think we might have an episode. Let's. Okay, I mean, I don't think we can give all of it that level. But uh, that's the preface. That leads, of course, to the introduction. Yes. Yes, it leads which to the introduction. Which. Kind of really goes straight into the rules. It goes almost straight into explaining what dice are. Yeah. Well, that's kind of had to then. I do, yeah, that's the weird thing. It's like the idea that it is so far back in time that you have to. Ex- There's like little pictures of the D4, D6, D8, D12, and D20. Remember, this was before D10s were a dedicated dice type. You just had special D20s that only had the one digit on each face. That was your D10 oh. back then. Yes. And. Or maybe he yeah. just didn't truck with uh, non Euclidean. Is it not? No, it's non. Yeah, no, yeah Euclidean it's solids. Euclidean, yeah. Um, no. Or they just weren't like the the market didn't have them then. Um, I I do also particularly like the next page, which has a attempt to explain the probability of both linear dice and bell curve dice with a wonderful description of you know the probability curve of three d six. Just to show you that, you know, it is actually possible if you get tw- uh, all 12s. Love it. It's... Uh, yeah, not the sort of thing you see in books today. Graphs and things like that. Another thing you don't see in books today is two separate paragraphs explaining why you should buy official miniatures uh, uh, and game aids mm. from TSR directly or their, or their licensed subsidiaries. I don't know. I think GW still put that in. Um, <laughs> well, Okay, well, will we leave it there and come back for the introduction next time, where it goes to two columns. And I'm pretty sure this is where two-column uh, standard comes from for core books. And I've talked about that in an episode in the past. Um, it is a thing. And like uh, my, my instinct is that so many of the things that are things in core books come from this book, or its, its neighbours. Uh, but we're kind of we're running up on... Yeah, that looks like the length of an episode. Will we leave it there for now? And it gives me a chance to do my homework. Read ahead. Okay. <laughs> not be su- not be surprised by any more shitting unicorns. <laughs> but I mean, I think yeah. Are we bleeping that? I hope so. Um, okay, fair enough. It's a excreting unicorn. Can I can I go with that? Yeah, sure. Why not? I I really do feel like if we can get excreting unicorn into the uh, the meme cycle. For the end of the year, I think we we're doing well. Right, so uh, we'll close that tome, having <laughs> having gotten through the preface, and uh, and talked a little bit about the introduction. Uh, Warlord Scar, any closing thoughts on the preface? Um, the there's so much that's actually just timeless good there. There's so much good sentiment and good advice, but there's also like the looming shadow of Guy Gax, the one true Gungeon Master. It's it's they're both there. The you can't just dismiss or accept everything in this book. Everything has to be put. You basically have to sort of alchemically separate out the components of everything that Guy Gax is writing in this. You have to pick through it. This 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 book refuses to simply be read on its own terms. You have to go in with tweezers and some form of weird acidic soap just to just to figure out what to make of it and i think that's why it's so enduring not because it's great but because it requires so much effort to to go through it and just figure out what the hell he's talking about um i i would admit right now i've barely gotten 30 pages into it it's been a track of wonder and amazement, both good amazement and bad amazement. Um, and certainly it's very inspiring, the good and the bad. So I, I definitely think I'm getting my money's worth uh, out of uh, having this tome to just look at and wonder why. Yeah, I'm going to read ahead. Um, I think we're going to return to this. This is probably an episode. Are we, we're going to release this as an episode, aren't we? Yes. Yes, I've just are. got that feeling now. Um, so, and I already know what the title is. <laughs> so, with that, folks, 
uh, join us in Discord. Let us know what you think. Um, and if there's any sections of the first edition, Advanced Dungeons and Dragon, uh, the one with the demon on the front of it, and <laughs> you know it's who. It's an Afriti. It's an Afriti. On the ti- oh, it's an Afriti. Okay. I, I don't know any D&D stuff. I don't know. Stuff. To be fair, it is basically unrecognizable as anything. But yeah. It's a great big goblin looking thing. Look, kind of Jim Henson looking thing. <laughs> um, yeah. This, we, I've been, um, I've been Savage Mick. I've been Warlord Scar. And we are the adventure, we are part of the adventure party. It's a big conglomerate of desperate weirdos. Uh, but for now, this party's over. You've been listening to the adventure party. We're a ragtag collective of uh, desperate souls uh, striving for truth in a world of tabletop gone mad. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter. Uh, you can email us at party at the adventuringparty.net. Although, between you and me, the best place to track us down is Discord. Check the show notes for a link. This podcast released under a Creative Commons Attribution Non Commercial Share Alike Version 3 license, which is like free, but with extra steps. Hope you enjoyed the show, and we'll see you next week.